in the last session of the day. And it'll be Daniel telling us about a connection between learning algorithms and circuit lower bounds. Take it away. All right. Uh, thanks for the introduction. Um, this is called quantum state learning implies circuit lower bounds. So let me adjust my mic like this. Um, it's joint work with Naihui and uh, Fong, who I believe are here attending. I don't know if they're in the, the room right now. Um, it's based on this work that's on the archive, though I'll actually be presenting some updates um, from that archive posting. Uh, and yeah, so a very fundamental problem in quantum information is producing a state. Um, so that's basically starting from say the all zero state, how many, like how much resources do you need to produce some target state? Um, for instance, if you want to prepare the uh, GHZ state and you're starting with all zeros and let's say your gate set is Hadamard and CZ gates, you might produce it like this. Um, if you have like a C naught and Hadamard gate set, uh, you might like decompose it slightly differently, but the idea is the same. And in general, you can ask like, how many gates do you need to produce a state? That's like a very um, concrete question you can ask. And um, this is basically what's known as like non-uniform state synthesis. So just like a very fu like fundamental minimization problem that you need just based on some defined gate set. Um, but a another notion of circuit complexity is that of uniform state synthesis. So which is how much time do you need to find the circuit? And time might be a little vague um, for circuits, but so I'll tell you exactly what I mean. So let's say I have a list of states, so psi n, where n is just some natural number. And if I tell you some natural number, how much time do you need to synthesize psi sub n? So n is some parameter that grows. So now we can talk about time as complexity, like some growth function. Like, do you need linear time? Do you need quadratic time? Do you need exponential time? Um, and that's why we need this natural number, similar to like, um, you know, functions and you know problems in uh, CS. We need to sort of have this notion of like, what is the size of the problem? Um, because asking like, what is the time to produce the GHC state? That doesn't really make too much sense. It's like a fixed number of qubits. You can just like output this in like zero time, basically. Okay. And we can take this a step further. So now we have a notion of time. We can introduce notions of like complexity classes. So you're probably familiar with P and NP and BQP if you're at this conference. So something you can define is um, this class called state BQP. Um, it's basically the set of all of these kind of state sequences that you can produce in polynomial time. And you can sort of think of these, this like state BQP as a characterization of problems with classical inputs and quantum outputs. So we have the same kind of bit string input, um, or you can generalize this to bit string inputs, and we have some quantum state as our output. So like a new kind of problem that is not characterized by normal classical complexity theory. Um, so yeah, there's like a slightly more formal definition. You add mixed states, you have like a, this bit string now instead of just a natural number, you only approximately create the state, so you have some robustness, but you know, that's just details that you shouldn't actually worry too much about. Um, and I just wanna add that like these state complexity classes do actually behave somewhat similar to the normal complexity classes that you might be familiar with. So there's a very fundamental result in a classical complexity theory that P space equals IP and um, it turns out that it was proven last year uh, by Metcair and Yuan that state P space equals state QIP. So there's like this fundamental connection that still exists even for these new kinds of quantum problems. And so basically something that I want to do is using this language, I want to talk about this like one bullet point intuition, which is that states that are harder to produce should be harder to learn in general. Um, and this basically follows from what we know about classical Boolean functions in that like Boolean functions that are more expressive, that are more powerful, should be harder to learn. Um, so some quantum examples is we have things like product states, stabilizer states, 
Now, constant depth circuits, these are like very, very easy to produce states. And these are the ones that we actually have learning algorithms for. And then some hard examples would be hard random states, like T designs that are super polynomial. These are hard to produce and hard to learn. So, and basically, can we formalize this connection? Like we're theorists, we have like intuition, but our goal is to basically formalize these intuitions for people as actual theorem statements. Um, and the, like, the takeaway of this talk is that there are ways to formalize this, and I'll go into exactly what I mean by that. Um, but the idea is that slightly non-trivial learning algorithms should imply new results about state synthesis. That's like a takeaway message of our uh, work, and there's like some framework that we show that works in a variety of ways. Um, and to do that, we're actually going to do a lot of things. We're going to have to use complexity theory to talk about state synthesis, learning theory, obviously. And then we're actually going to have to take a path through cryptography to actually show these results. Um, so what do I exactly mean by quantum state learning? Um, uh, I really mean it in like the traditional tomographical sense. So just given multiple copies of some unknown state row to produce a row hat that approximates this, like some classical description, um, and it's known that this requires an exponential amount of samples and time in the worst case. So this is a you know, known hard problem. And so generally what we do in the learning community is we make assumptions about the data. Like there's some no free lunch theorem. So we actually have to start making assumptions. And some assumptions we might make are things that are produced by some circuit class, ground states of Hamiltonians, matrix product states, things like that. Um, and basically, a more formal version of our result is that if you can do like two to the slightly under linear samples and two to the poly time quantum state learning algorithms for states produced by some constant class C, this will imply learning like lower bounds for state C. Um, that seems somewhat vague, probably, to most of you. So, um, okay. A more concrete example is, let's say we have non-trivial learning algorithms. So basically the same parameters that I showed you before for states produced by this uh, circuit class called QTC0. Um, you don't have to know exactly what QTC0 is just yet, but basically our results would show that either one of the two is true. So either state BQE, um, where BQE is this like exponential linear time uh, is not contained in state QTC, state QTC zero, or for every K greater than or equal to one, there's this following separation between state BQ sub X and state BQ size. Um, if you're not really familiar with uh, circuit like complexity lower bounds, this might not seem that interesting to you, but it turns out that in general, like, Showing circuit lower bounds is a very, very hard problem. Um, if you're not aware, like there's only, like we only really have results for these very, very weak classes to not be in like NX and things like that. These are like fundamental results in classical complexity theory by Ryan Williams and his students. So it's like very, very difficult to prove lower bounds. And this was basically in one direction saying that there's like a path to prove it via quantum state learning. Um, and I guess I sort of did this out of order, but I want to say that, emphasize that these parameters that I put out, the two to the n to the 0.99, um, is like just slightly non-trivial. And the reason for that is that I told you before that you can do tomography in two to the theta n samples in time. And also by a shadow tomography, um, any class produced that's like efficiently producible by a polynomial size circuit can be done using shadow tomography with like super polynomial samples and like two to the super polynomial time. So if you can if you can either reduce the time or the sample complexity of brute force tomography or reduce the time of shadow tomography even just a little bit, you'll uh, imply some like interesting non-trivial circuit lower bounds. And uh, I should emphasize that this like 0.99 is not like specific to 0.99. It's just some concrete number that's less than one. Um, okay. Um, as a bonus, 
I, I was talking about like state complexity classes before, but we also proved things about um, decision problem versions, like the traditional complexity classes. Um, but I actually won't really go into this in this talk, um, but you can ask me about that later. Okay, so where does cryptography come into play? Well, a general property of a pseudo-random object, which is inherent in cryptography, is that they're efficient to construct, but they're hard to distinguish from true random. So um, naturally, pseudo-randomness is like at complete odds with learning. This is why things like learning with errors and learning parodies with noise are like the fundamental cryptographic hard results. Um, and you can see this basically an informal statement is that hard to distinguish from random implies hard to learn. And you might formally know this as like um, a generalization of the no free lunch theorem and things like that. So, on the quantum state side of things, there's this concept called pseudo-random states that have been talked about, I think, throughout this uh, conference uh, by Tomoyuki and others, um, which is a quantum state that looks far random, but is easy to produce. So therefore, it's actually very far from being hard random, but uh, cannot be distinguished from it. And the no free lunch theorem naturally holds for this. It's not too hard to prove. And basically a very dream goal of ours would be to say that if pseudo random state ensembles exist that have um, really strong security, so they're secure against like very, very strong adversaries, but they're also efficiently synthesizable, then uh, any non-trivial learning algorithms for a circuit class C would imply the following circuit lower bound. So it's basically saying that um, this pseudo random state is in state BQP um, because it's synthesizable in polynomial time. And it is not in state C. And the reason for that is that because you can learn state C, that means that state C cannot produce pseudo random states. So therefore it's in BQP, but not state C. Does everyone see that? Or if you don't see that, then you get lost a little bit later. Um, <laughs> Any questions? Okay, good. Um, and I should note that this is achievable with some strong cryptographic assumptions, such as you know, sub-exponential secure LWE. This is how some other works, I think by Matthias and others basically work. And um, that's all fine and good, but um, basically all of the results in this vein rely on L like LWE or things like that. And well, I don't, I'm not saying that LWE is necessarily like easy. I'm not making such a claim, but like it's, it would be good that we don't rely on just one assumption for all of our hardness results. Like we would maybe like try to get evidence in other ways, right? Like branch out a little bit. And the, one of the highlights of this talk is that we're going to get um, these kinds of hardness results without making any cryptographic assumptions. Um, so the goal is that we can, can we produce pseudo random states without making cryptographic sum, assumptions like one way functions and things like that or LWE. Um, and okay, yeah, I guess the highlight of this talk is that it turns out that you can sort of make such statements but they're not quite as strong as what we would hope for. Um, let's see. Okay, this kind of went out of order, unfortunately, but um. The main thrust of our work is to show the following, that if state, like this weird P space size class that I'm not actually going to define, but is quite related to state P space, is uh, not contained in state BQ sub X. Um, basically, there's like some uh, state synthesis separation that implies a pseudo random state ensemble. And it has the following parameters. Unfortunately, it's synthesizable in exponential time um, instead of polynomial time, but it is secure against sub-exponential time adversaries. And that's really the goal of ours. Um, and basically, uh, this PRS can be turned into a state sequence without too much effort. And basically the following uh, 
set of like logic that we applied before applies now, except now we have state BQE for this two to the exponential, the two to the theta n time rather than state BQP because polynomial time. Um, okay, so this relied on this particular complexity theoretic assumption. Um, something else we do is we show that if the other assumption is true, like if um, either it's, it is contained or is not contained. So if it is in fact contained, then we show a different circuit lower bound. Um, it's not too interesting, I think, um, but it's basically why we have two bullet points in our statement. Um, and if you wanna know more, it involves the following ideas from complexity theory, like yeah, BQP is in P space, quantum state discrimination, circuit size hierarchy theorems and things like that. Um, okay. So how do we actually build this PRS? Well, we basically rely on this great result by uh, some of the audience members here, um, that if P space is not contained in BQ sub X, then there exists a pseudo random generator that has a very similar set of qualities than the pseudo random state that we create. And um, so the, the goal is basically to turn this PRG into a PRS. Um, there are some standard tricks to do this in the cryptography literature but it turns out that because of the parameters of this PRG being a little non-standard, those techniques don't actually work in a straightforward way. Um, this is why we had to introduce this class called state P space size and things like that. Um, in the interest of time, I won't go into the de details, but you can again, ask me about that later. Um, okay. And then I just wanna add that uh, there's also this notion of unitary synthesis that was introduced along with state synthesis and that we can basically um, make similar statements about that. There's something called a pseudo random unitary. Um, we can construct pseudo random unitaries based on these complexity theoretic assumptions based on unitary synthesis, um, which may be of independent interest. Um, unfortunately, we can't really write it up until Robert Huang and Fermi Ma finish their stuff. Um, but yeah, uh, I've talked to them in private. It should all work uh, without too much issue. Um, and this is like the formal statement or slightly more formal statement that slightly non-trivial learning algorithms for unitaries will imply circuit lower bounds for unitary synthesis. Um, and the same is true for decision problems. And that requires a follow-up to the follow-up of the Robert Huang and Fermi Ma paper. So that one will take a while come out. Um, yeah, so that basically wraps up what I wanted to say. Um, so open problems are basically, can we tighten the parameters of this pseudo random state or pseudo random unitary that we create? Um, ideally, we would create these in less than exponential time. Like we want to get that down to polynomial time. Um, basically, it would lead to better and more interesting complexity theoretic separations. Um, there's Further connections to meta complexity that was in previous predecessor works for classical Boolean functions um, that we have, haven't really explored too much. And um, a call to the learning people here is can you maybe you know, actually create some of these non trivial algorithms to instantiate some of these theorems? Um, so basically, can you do slightly better than brute force or slightly better than uh, classical shadows? Um, and uh, yeah, I will be finishing my postdoc in 2025. So uh, if you have any uh, positions, academic positions, you think I'd be a good fit for, uh, please let me know. And that's it. Hey, thanks a lot, Daniel. And we've got some time for questions. I see one by Alex. So in the winning argument, apparently, okay, one of the sides, you'll only need the classical, the classical assumption, right? And then you will show that okay, it implies a quantum assumption. Can one help, uh, hope for having just the classical assumption on the other side as well? Um, like, in the, uh, yeah, can you hope to have the classical assumption here as well? Um, so this one cannot work with the uh, classical assumption, uh, but, 
this one does work if you just have the classical assumption, but then you have the, they're not, it's not like one or the, it's no longer one way. Yeah. Do we have more questions? I've got an ill-defined one. So I find this idea interesting of how you say you want to kind of get rid of cryptographic assumptions and you do it with this kind of win-win. Mm -hmm. Is this something that is applicable in other scenarios or is it very specifically when you're aiming for circuit lower bounds? I mean, it's the only context where I've seen it. But, but... I mean, win-win arguments certainly happen all kinds of proofs and things like that. Um, is there anything more concrete you're... So I guess I'm wondering whether we can replace uh, pseudo-random, say, generators or whatever, obtained from cryptographic assumptions by these kind of win-win pseudo-random constructions in other scenarios. As I said, it's not quite oh, well I see, defined. I, but... um, I think the answer is... Probably not. Um, the win-win argument, like one side of the win-win argument is kind of um, specific to things that are like diagonalizable, I guess, in a sense, which is like a sort of a specific property of things that um, you can like count and grow in a certain way. Um, so my... Yeah, understanding that it's not generally applicable. Yeah. Some more questions from the audience? All right. Then let's thank Daniel again for his talk. <laughs>